I'm going to talk to you about community, community and Tourette syndrome. We all have a community where we live, where we go to school, where we go to work, where we spend our days interacting with others, our social lives, our friendships, our activities, where we worship, exercise, grocery shop, or volunteer. For children, it's usually where they go to school. Where do they spend the rest of their day? Is it daycare? Is it the neighborhood park? Is it soccer practice, swim team, or music lessons? For our family and our son, we soon realized that Tourette syndrome was going to heavily impact every day. For some, TS may not affect us severely. We had to make a decision early on how we were going to live with this disorder in our community. Opting out or hiding out was not an option for our family. Although there were several times during a lot of very difficult periods where I would think how much easier it would be if I just took him out of school and ran away. <laughs> Boy, that sounded good more than once. Our goal with our son with Tourette syndrome was to assist him to grow to his potential and to handle this difficult disorder with grace. This was a very conscious decision for our family. In order to do this, we believed it would take a lot of education and a lot of clear, correct choices. We clearly looked at our community and chose who we felt we needed to educate. If we were out of our community, such as traveling or out of our routine, it was more of a spontaneous decision. Maybe it was worth educating the person or the group we were with, but maybe it was okay just to move on and forget the education that afternoon. We shopped at specific stores. I went to a special dry cleaner. We bought dog food in one spot, bird food in another. I did this for a reason. I wanted the community to meet my son and know my son during his formative years. I wanted him to develop a healthy sense of self. I encouraged our son to talk with people, to introduce himself, <coughs> to let them know that he had Tourette syndrome, that he made different kinds of movements and sounds, and that he said things that might surprise people rather unexpectedly. We encouraged interaction with all the staff at our children's school. We met our neighbors. My son had lemonade stands in the summertime. He sold Cub Scout popcorn in the fall. When his coprolalia got really bad and he would yell the F word out the front door and it would echo against the mountain we live on the side of, I walked door to door and talked to all of our neighbors. We encouraged our son to say hello to the security officers in stores and in the schools. We asked him to introduce himself to the librarian and the guy in the mini mart where he liked to ride his bike to get candy. Because for our son to develop a healthy self-esteem, he needed to feel functional, responsible, capable, and happy. Hard to develop these things if people stare at you all day long, give you ugly looks, and want to punish you. By having a routine, by educating those around our son openly about Tourette syndrome, he learned about Tourette syndrome and how it affected him personally. He grew conscious of his good days and his bad days, days when it might be best to spend his time riding his bike or playing outside. Maybe going to the library wasn't good that day. Maybe a movie wasn't going to be the most positive place he could spend his time that day. He learned to say, no, we better not do a movie. Could we go bowling instead? That's a lot noisier, and I won't bother people with my tics. Going to the Children's Museum was always a good place to go. It was filled with action-packed kids doing hands-on activities. He was able to move and verbalize freely in that environment. It was a lot better than probably most times going to a chess tournament with one of his friends where he would definitely be stared at and probably take some pretty ugly glances. We chose not to educate everybody. 
It could take up our entire day. We knew Tourette syndrome was a big part of life, as our son's was pretty severe, but we never wanted to make our life about Tourette syndrome. If we were traveling someplace and ran into a market, or we were going by taxi somewhere and something happened, we probably would more often than not choose to not educate. We often would choose to get humor, to use humor to get us through a situation in something like that. And these moments of humor, we still laugh at as a family. One time, Zach and I ran into a market in Lake Tahoe to pick up some ground beef to make hamburgers where we were camping. At that time, he had a horrible barking noise that a woman at the meat counter mistook for a bad case of croup. He barked and barked and she stared. He, of course, noticed this right away and barked even louder. <laughs> she gave him a concerned look and she said to me, you need to get him to the doctor right away. He sounds awfully sick. Zach immediately fell into this role, slumped a bit against me and said, yes, I feel awful and my mom won't take me to the doctor. <laughs> This woman looked at me and gave me a horrified look. <laughs> at first, I was taken aback, being so used to the bark. Then, seeing what he was doing, I quickly responded with, we're going straight to the ER. <laughs> <laughs> we felt our relationship with our son was the most important thing in the world. His disinhibition was pretty severe, and we never knew how or when a situation was going to arise. We had to find a healthy balance in which to live our lives in order to guide him and support him and our other children into adulthood. Choosing who, we'd, who we would educate was important. How we educated was important also. There were different times in his life. What stage of development was he in? Was he super conscious of his tics? Was he embarrassed? Was he tired? Was he hungry? What time of day did we need to do this education? Was he, re was he feeling resourceful or talkative at this particular time when the situation arose? Sometimes educating was just an apology of, I didn't mean to say that, I have Tourette syndrome, I'm sorry. He learned when he was 10 and burst out into a very inappropriate saying at Boy Scouts that he needed to apologize educate, forgive himself, and move on. It was out of his control. He did need to take care of things, but then he needed to move on to the next event. In keeping to our community and educating those that we came into contact with frequently or routinely, our son learned early on how important advocacy was. He learned how to do it and that gradually it was going to become his full-time responsibility. Within our community of where we shopped, bought our clothes, took our dry cleaning, bought our dog food, our son grew to know these people and likewise they knew to understand him and to learn about Tourette syndrome. He was comfortable in his environment, in his community, and both of these began to expand. He grew more adventurous and comfortable in self-advocacy. He learned when he needed to educate and when he didn't really need to. He learned who was important to educate, such as the National Guard at LaGuardia Airport after 9-11, and he had to touch everything. He learned that it was always best to make direct eye contact with a police officer or a security guard in any store that he walked into but maybe it wasn't so important to make eye contact or educate the guy who was heckling him in the line at McDonald's. There was always the need for continual education. Every year a new teacher, new crossing guards, a different bus driver, a new security officer at the high school. Starting a new school was always stressful for the family, but we had a big rule our kid never stepped into a new school without a full in-service, and we included everybody. Before swim practice would begin in the summer, this mom educated the new coach, met the parents, and let them all know that any of, any of them or their children had questions on Tourette, 
any of our children, my husband and I would be glad to answer those questions at any time. As a young child, my husband and I were involved with all of his activities. His disinhibition was severe, and he would get into situations that he did not have the coping skills to pull himself out of. He needed more hand-holding, more guidance and support than other children his age. Frequently, one of us would have to jump in and pull him out of a sticky situation before he learned how to do it himself. We were both Cub Scout leaders, swim parents, I was the room mother. I went on all the field trips. We held a lot of movie nights and barbecues in our backyard. Our house was the house where kids piled up. I always had cookies and a surplus of popcorn. As our son grew, so did his activities. My husband attended all Boy Scout meetings and all campouts. As our son grew more capable of handling his own disinhibition, we gave him more room. My husband might have gone on a Boy Scout camp out, but maybe he supervised another group of boys. He was there in case there was a situation he needed to jump into, but he wasn't right on top of our son. We were involved with the Tourette Syndrome chapter in our city. This in turn educated our community even more. We hung posters and store windows with permission. We put flyers and pamphlets about TSA and doctor offices and hospitals. We talked to libraries and coffee shops where we posted TSA community events. As we did things, we met people, we talked to people, we educated people, and we always went back to see them again. As I mentioned before, I believe the relationship between you and the child is critical. Whether you are the teacher, the social worker, the counselor, the janitor, the cafeteria lady, or the parent, these kids need a friendly face and a kind word to feel secure in their environment. I never wanted my child to feel embarrassed of who he was or what he had. A sense of humor is always good. When my son had to do deep knee bends to the grocery store, to the back where the pharmacy was, I did them too. When we got back there, due to his loud whoopings, and his windmilling arms, the pharmacist already had his medications on the counter. <laughs> My son and I looked at each other and we both laughed. It felt so good that we could do that. As we educated our community, we educated our son. Our son learned to self-advocate. Knowing how to self-advocate self -advocate is priceless. He learned how to build relationships with his teachers, the security guards at the school, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, the librarians, and these are people that can make or break your day. As much as I wanted my son respected and liked by the people in the community, I also wanted him to be respectful of others. If his tics were loud or distracting, he didn't go certain places. He learned that if they were difficult for him, they might be difficult for those around him. He needed to make good choices and respectful choices. I will never forget our family's introduction into the need for community education around disinhibition. That Walmart parking lady, that poor woman, the look on my son's face when I whirled him around and he said, Mom, I didn't say that. How far we came when many years later, my family with my brother's family decided to drive up to Santa Fe during the Christmas season. The plaza was busy with lots of tourists, of course. And along came a long funeral procession headed towards a very large church at the head of the plaza. Out of the blue, my six foot five son yells, who's the dead guy? <laughs> my, my brother grabbed my arm and he said, oh my gosh, did he just say that? I calmly remarked, yes, he did. Just keep walking. No one, <laughs> no one will know we're related to him. <laughs> and as I walked off the plaza, I thought to myself, this is one of those times and places I'm not going to stop and educate. <laughs> Thanks.